Hi there, this is Professor Schimmeld back with uh, a discussion of parasitology and we will also do a survey of some of the uh, parasitic protozoans. Now this is a pretty long section and so I'm going to um, try to keep it down to bite-sized pieces for you guys. There could be as many as, I, I don't know, I'm guessing here, but um, six or more segments. So we'll, we'll see how that works out. I thought what I would do is begin with, um, if you take a look at your outline, you'll see it begins with some uh, vocabulary, some terms that relate to parasitology. So first of all, what is parasitology? Well, the word literally means the study of parasitic organisms. And that's a really, uh, really a very broad umbrella. There are many parasitic organisms and uh, depending on exactly how you define what is a parasite, the umbrella can be larger or smaller. But we're going to concentrate primarily on uh, protozoans that are parasitic and, and it's not a whole lot of them uh, as far as the protozoans that are present here on planet Earth. And then we'll also talk a little bit about some of the multicellular parasitic organisms known as the helminths. Sometimes they're referred to by laypersons as the worms. I mean, things like tapeworms and roundworms and other um, uh, kind of nasties. Okay, but let's go ahead in this segment and let's go over the terminology, the vocabulary that's on the first page of your outline. Um, all right, so what is a parasite? Well, a parasite can be defined as an organism that is in close contact with its host. And so when, uh, what I mean by close contact is, is that the parasite might be um, on the surface um, of its host, like, uh, for example, um, ticks and fleas, and, and there are some other parasitic organisms that may um, be on the, um, the exterior of the body. Um, or uh, close contact could mean that the parasitic organism is inside of their um, of their host species, and that could be um, in the bloodstream, um, in an organ, in muscle tissue, or more than one of those possibilities. So, all right, let me back it up. A parasite, it's an organism that's in close contact with its host, and the parasite is metabolically dependent upon its host. Now, this is a, uh, um, a one-way relationship, the parasite benefits at the expense of the host, uh, but I've always found this interesting. Um, parasitic relations are highly evolved, and I mean over millennia, all right? And so um, what I would classify as being a successful parasite is one that doesn't actually kill its host, right? It, it obtains what it needs, um, shelter, um, nutrition, um, a, a way to reproduce, uh, from its host and at its host's expense, but a good parasite doesn't kill its host because uh, what are you going to do if you live in the GI tract of your host and you kill your host? Well, uh, it might be difficult to um, actually uh, make your way successfully out of that host and find another good situation. So good parasites, successful parasites, they don't actually kill their host. So parasite um, in close contact with the host, it's metabolically dependent upon the host let me elaborate a little bit about what I mean by metabolic dependence. Uh, it could include several different things. First of all, the obvious one would be that the parasite obtains all of its nutrients from the host organism. Could be um, feeding on uh, the host's um, normal flora, like in the GI tract, or feeding literally on the host itself, like host red blood cells or, or other tissue cells. So nutrition would be the first example of metabolic dependence. Um, secondly, uh, metabolic dependence could be for what we refer to as being developmental stimuli. Here's what I mean. In some parasitic relationships, the host provides the parasite a hormone that the parasite requires to develop into its next stage, the next stage in its life cycle. Like maybe there's a hormone required to um, allow the eggs to hatch and the larval form to escape, or maybe there's a different hormone that the larval parasite needs to go ahead and complete development into its adult form. So uh, that's a possibility as well. And, um, uh, excuse me, metabolic dependence could also be for um, certain factors like um, enzymes and vitamins 
that the parasite is unable to produce on its own. Now, let me talk, just before I go on to the next term, vector, let me talk a little bit about um, parasites. Uh, all right, a couple of analogies. You, you've heard the expression, um, use it or lose it, right? Okay, well, this uh, is something that has happened really to the max with parasitic uh, relationships. So, as I said earlier, these relationships have evolved over millennia, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, or likely more than that. Um, and so, uh, let's say you were a tapeworm, and so you live in the uh, lower GI tract of your host. Well, that's a pretty protected environment, right? And um, you are constantly, you've attached yourself, you're, you're the tapeworm, right? You've attached yourself using your hooks and your scolex to the uh, intestinal lining of your host. And then the rest of your body, which is made up of uh, little segments called proglottids, they form long tape-like um, uh, arrangements. It's just kind of floating around in the intestine of your host. And so uh, you are, you the tapeworm, are being constantly bathed with pre-digested food. All right, so use it or lose it, right? Well, if you are living in this very protected environment, why would you need a nervous system? You, you don't really need to respond to a stimulus, right? So um, tapeworms have um, essentially no nervous system. Okay, the being bathed in pre-digested uh, pre nutrients thing. Why would you need a digestive system if all of your nutrients have been digested and are in a usable form for you? Tapeworms totally lack a digestive system. What tapeworms are essentially are uh, just um, very efficient reproductive machines. Um, okay, let's go ahead and move on. So metabolic dependence, that could be for nutrition, for a developmental stimulus, or for enzymes, cofactors, vitamins that the parasite is unable to synthesize on its own. Let's go to the next term, and uh, that would be um, vector. Now, there are different uh, definitions of the word vector, and really context is everything, you guys. And the context here is we're talking about a vector uh, under the um, heading of biology. So I'm talking about a biological vector. Now, a vector is an organism that's going to transmit the parasitic organism to humans. All right, and that could be um, um, an insect, for example, like a mosquito or a tick or something else. Um, all right, next definition is um, incidental parasite. Now, what does the word incidental mean? Um, well, incidentally, oh, by the way, oh, not usually um, the, the case here. Well, an incidental parasite is a parasitic organism that doesn't usually infect humans, but under certain circumstances, humans may become infected. We're going to, in a little while, we're going to discuss um, the um, life cycle of the uh, tapeworm um, Dipalidium caninum. Usually infects uh, dogs and cats, but sometimes humans get involved, so we'll, we'll take another look at this later. So Dipalidium caninum is an incidental parasite of humans, usually infects dogs or cats, sometimes people get infected. Okay, next term is reservoir host. Now, this is the host in the parasitic life cycle that harbors the same stage of the parasite that we find in humans. All right, more on that in a minute. Um, so we say that this host serves as a reservoir for possible transmission of the parasite to humans. So if you look at this um, life cycle again, uh, the... Um, human, when they are infected, is going to be uh, infected with the adult stage in the tapeworm's life cycle. And then if you look at this right here between the, uh, the dog and the flea, uh, that's the, um, let's say, the normal life cycle of um, Dipalidium caninum. Um, and you can see when you look at this life cycle that the dog, when it is infected, will also have the adult stage of this tapeworm. So we say in this life cycle, the dog is the reservoir host of this parasite. Okay, so I'm moving on uh, to definitive host, also uh, sometimes referred to as final host. Now, this is the host in the parasitic life cycle that contains or harbors the adult and the sexually reproducing stage of the parasite. 
harbors the adult and sexually reproducing stage of the parasite. We're going to apply these definitions to this uh, tapeworm life cycle in just a little while. It'll actually probably uh, um, be in the next segment. Let me see how I feel about that in a minute. Um, so I'll, I'll give you more information on that. All right, now intermediate host is next, and we can define that as the host in the parasitic life cycle that contains or is infected with or, or harbors, however you want to phrase that. Um, the um, immature and asexually reproducing stage of the parasite, often that's referred to as a larva or the larval stage of the parasite. And uh, the last term on your list there is uh, fomite. You know, I think we've covered this one before, but let me go ahead and uh, just give you the definition again. Anyways, a fomite is a, um, a contaminated inanimate object, right? It could be a surface, it could be um, um, a writing implement, uh, it could be a drinking vessel, all right? Anyways, but it's inanimate. It never was alive. It's been contaminated. It could be with a virus, a bacterium, um, a parasitic protozoan. Um, and anyways, it is used to um, uh, transmit the infection to humans. Okay, why don't we call it good for this segment? And I will pick it up with, um, um, if you look on your outline, item number two is a parasitic life cycle. So we'll talk about uh, the different types of parasitic life cycles and um, we'll discuss an example of each of the two major types of parasitic life cycles in the next section. Okay, thanks for watching. I'll be back.